Well, as I've communicated to most of you in recent weeks, in light of our present situation, our present crisis, you could call it, I believe it's extremely important that we use our time together in God's word to really dig into what scripture says in matters that directly relate to our circumstances right now. So that should include that which helps us to get by each day with strength and encouragement from the Lord, that which helps us to understand the current issues of the day from a biblical perspective, and also that which helps us to grow in our understanding and appreciation for the very thing we're all struggling with going without right now, and that is the gathering of the local church. So theologically speaking, the doctrine of the church is referred to as ecclesiology, <clears throat> Excuse me, and that will be um, what the Bible teaches about the church. Ecclesiology is what the Bible teaches about the church. So starting um, this morning, and I'm not sure for how many weeks yet, I'm going to be turning on the fire hose of ecclesiology so that we can all be thoroughly saturated in it for a number of weeks with the hope and prayer that all of us, including myself, might come away with a richer deeper and more comprehensive understanding of the church and as a result that we would grow more in our love for the church and our appreciation for the corporate in-person gathering of the people of God by which we can know Christ, grow Christ, grow in Christ, serve Christ, share Christ and glorify Christ. So the title of the first message in this series this morning is The Church Part 1 Origins. And I'm just going to fill the screen with you for this right now. Um, the church part one origins. And as we look at this subject of the church, there's really one primary underlying or foundational reason why I believe all Christians should have a great esteem for, love for, and devotion to the church. And this is found in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. If you want to turn them in your Bibles, um, I will be putting the scriptures up on the screen. Um, but for these couple of initial scriptures, let's have a look at these in our Bibles and you can follow along in your Bibles as we go through. We're going to look at a lot of verses today. Acts chapter 20 and verse 28 says this, Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Why is the church so important? Why is the church so precious in God's eyes? Why is the church so worthy of our commitment, love and devotion? It's because Christ purchased the church with his own blood. Christ loves the church that much. Now, if something or someone is that precious to a person that they would give their own blood or more importantly that the son of god would give his own blood then you'd expect to see evidence of that in the way they relate to that thing or that person and that's exactly what we see in ephesians chapter 5 if you'd like to please turn there next ephesians chapter 5. so these are very very familiar verses to us, very familiar verses to us. And almost every time I have taught or read these verses, and no doubt almost every time you have heard this passage taught or read it for yourself, it would have been in the context of the earthly marriage relationship. However, as I read from verse 22 in a moment, I want you to try and read this as not just relating to husbands and wives in the context of marriage. Of course, we all know that this is one of the purposes of this passage, but what Paul makes very clear here is that all of the application to marriage in this passage is a secondary and therefore more inferior application of a much greater and more superior truth, which is the relationship between Christ and the church. So husbands and wives and all of us as we read these verses let us make the effort now to focus on what it says about the church at this time more than what it says about marriage and as you do you will in fact find that you'll be blessed and encouraged in the area of marriage too as a beautiful byproduct if you like of the main truth being presented so ephesians 5 from verse 22 ephesians 5 from verse 22 
Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is saviour of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, <clears throat> so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Isn't that incredible? Look what this passage tells us about Christ's relationship to the church. It tells us that Christ is the head of his church. Verse 23, meaning that he has authority over it. That should be a great reassurance to us. Christ is the one calling the shots. Christ is the one who says what the church should do and how it should do it and when. Christ is the one to whom all things are in subjection. The church belongs to Christ. He is the great shepherd of the sheep and we are his sheep. We also see that Christ is the saviour of his church, meaning that he has given his life for it. This should be a great joy to us. There is no greater sacrifice imaginable than the Son of God, God in the flesh, fully man, fully God, coming to earth to take the full punishment for our sins and the full wrath of his Father, granting us righteousness, forgiveness, and the gift of eternal life to all who would repent, which means to turn from sin, and to turn to God by placing their trust in Christ alone. We are justified in the sight of God because of the atoning work of Christ, his work on the cross. We also see that Christ sacrificially loves his church, meaning that he has an unconditional love for it. That should be a great blessing to us. When we are faithless, he remains faithful. His love for us is not based on our performance, but upon his faithfulness. When we fall and fail, he picks us up again. He cannot be disappointed by us because he knows everything about us. This doesn't mean that we never grieve him when we sin, because we do. But this doesn't change his love for us. And he's ever interceding for us at the right hand of the throne of his Father. What a great love Christ has for his church. We also see that Christ is the sanctifier of his church in verse 25, meaning that he has promised to perfect it. That should be a great encouragement to us. Christ is the author and the finisher of our faith. He's the Alpha and the Omega, and by his spirit we are made more like him. The good work that he has begun, he will continue until the day of Jesus Christ. He who calls us is faithful, who also will do it. And by his word, we grow and mature and become more like Christ in our nature and conduct. Lastly, we see that Christ nourishes and cherishes his church in verse 29, meaning he takes tender care of it. Now, that should be a great comfort to us. What tender care Christ has for his church. He nourishes and cherishes us because we are his. We belong to him. When people mock us for our gospel witness, they're mocking him. When people hate us for our gospel witness, they hate him. And when people seek to hinder and restrict us for our gospel witness, they are hindering and restricting him, or at least attempting to. <clears throat> God is for us, not against us. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. And at every moment of every day of our lives, Christ is caring for us and upholding us and fully available to us. Now, one of the tangible ways in which Christ nourishes and cherishes his church is through the means of grace that he has made available to us, through the in-person gathering of the local church. 
as he washes us in the water of his word, as we worship, as we pray and are able to bring our burdens and troubles to him and seek him for guidance and strength, as we fellowship together and as we take part in the sacraments of the Lord's Supper and baptism, which are also both a means of grace. The means of grace are God's appointed instruments by which the Holy Spirit enables believers to receive and experience Christ and the benefits and blessings of redemption. So we see just in these verses that, yes, it is very evident to us how precious the church is in God's eyes, the church that Christ purchased with his own blood. I think these truths are really good for us to linger on, to digest and to meditate upon, especially in the times in which we are living, when increasingly in the world, our freedoms as Christians to gather as the church are being taken away. And therefore, those essential means of grace are greatly hindered. So I wanted to begin there. And as we go through these studies, I'll continue to mention this underlying foundational reason why the church is so important, why the church is so precious in God's eyes, and why the church is so worthy of our commitment, love, and devotion. And again, it is because Christ purchased the church with his own blood. Now, if you think about it, the church is Christ's primary work in the world today. In the time in which we live, that is his priority right now on the biblical timeline. In a moment, we're going to look at the origins of the church as we see it revealed through the pages of Scripture. But just before we do this, I want to bring some clarity as to how we understand this word church. How do we define the church? Well, contrary to what many people still believe in society, the church is not a building, but a people. The church is not a building, but a people. People don't go to church. The church goes to the building. In the first part of Romans 6, verse 5, as Paul closes his letter with some greetings, he says this. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. He's clearly referring there to a body of believers, not the building or the house they're meeting in. The word translated as church in the New Testament is the Greek word ekklesia. Ekklesia. There are two other instances of a different Greek word being translated as church in the New Testament, which mean belonging to the Lord. But this word ecclesia, the most commonly used, is a word that speaks of an assembly and more specifically, those who are called out. This is because of the two compound words that this word is formed from, the preposition ek, out, and the verb kaleo, call. Now, it had the secular meaning during the early church period of referring to those who were called out of their homes to a particular place of assembly. So going by the root meaning of this word as it was used, it will be more accurate to say that it really means called together. And then as the word was used in the New Testament, it also came to refer to the concept of believers being those who are called out of this world and into Christ's kingdom. So in a sense, it carries both meanings, the spiritual meaning that relates to the kind of people, the nature of the people, and the physical meaning that relates to the activity. And each meaning is really determined by the context in which it is used. Listen to what Charles Ryrie points points out about this word in his book, Basic Theology. And listen carefully, because this is very relevant to us right now. He says the Greek word, ekklesia, meant an assembly and was used in a political, not a religious sense in Greek culture. It did not refer to the people wherever they were, but to the meeting. In other words, and this is the key point, when the people were not assembled formally together, they were not referred to as an ecclesia. So important. That is why this, what we are doing right now online, as helpful as it may be, cannot be called church. Because it isn't. The church is a gathering and that gathering is only the local church in practice when believers, when the church are gathered together in person. Of course, we're still the church in a universal sense and I'll speak about that in a moment. But we are not, strictly speaking, the ecclesia unless we are gathered together corporally. And this adds the necessary weight behind those words in Hebrews 10, 24, that we're hearing so much at the moment. Let's look at them again from Hebrews Uh, 10 verse 23 let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful and let us consider one another in love 
in order to stir up love and good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. So it says not forsaking the assembling. The Greek word used for assembling there in verse 25 is episynagoge, and it means an assembly or a complete collection or a gathering together in one place. So from these things, I'm sure we can see the importance of and the essentiality of the in-person gathering of the local church. Now, of course, in a mystical sense, the church is not just a gathering either. Rather, it is by God's own definition also the body of Christ. The church is the body of Christ. We saw this earlier in the Ephesians 5 passage. And even before that, in chapter 1 of Ephesians, we see this. Ephesians 1 verses 22 and 23 says, And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So as members of the church, we are members of Christ's body and therefore members of one another. The church is also described using the metaphor of a family or a household. The church is a family. In Galatians 6.10, it says, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who have the household of faith. Ephesians 2.19 says, Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. There are many other metaphors that describe the church, which we'll look at um, in future messages in this series. But even just taking into consideration the metaphor of a body, and the metaphor of a family, again, it drives home the importance of the parts of the body and the members of this family functioning together in close proximity. That's why it's right and understandable that we sense loss when we are not gathering together in person, just like if parts of our body were put in different locations, or if each member of our family existed in separate rooms only communicating via Zoom, it just wouldn't be the same. It was Charles Spurgeon who described the church as the dearest place on earth. And it's been said that for all who know and love the Lord Jesus Christ, no place in the world should be sweeter or more cherished than the church. Now, someone could say, but if the body of Christ is worldwide, we can't all be together in close proximity. Well, that's correct. But it's a case of both and not either or. Let me explain. Theologically speaking, the church is often defined in two main ways. Firstly, there is the universal church, which is comprised of all true believers across the world who've been born again and baptized into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit and those who are in heaven who became believers within the church age. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, one universal body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. Then there is the local church, <clears throat> which is more of a regional or localized gathering. This speaks of an assembly of believers under the governance of Christ, the chief shepherd, through the earthly office of elders who are appointed as under shepherds. So both the universal church and the local church are the church. It's just that the local church is where believers can more tangibly and personally apply the one another's we see in the New Testament and also the body principles of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, encouraging, teaching, building one another up in the knowledge and grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, regarding the uniqueness of the local church, John MacArthur says it this way. The true church scattered throughout the world manifests itself in local assemblies for the purpose of putting salvation power on display and proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ in every place. That's the church's role, to preach the gospel which it demonstrates by its life, its transformed life to the watching world. We're not to be fashionable, we're to be faithful. We're not to be popular, we are to be persecuted. We're not to be a social force, we're to be a salvation force we're not to be offering tolerance in love but declaring truth in love every expression of the lord's church in the world is to be marked by biblical 
fidelity. The local church has a unique place. We'll be talking about the distinctiveness, the uniqueness of the local church in the coming weeks. But even today, again, reading in our news here in New Zealand, the church being compared as they think of lockdown measures to gyms, to bars. The church is not comparable to a gym or a bar. The church is totally different. It is not social. It is spiritual. It is not a nice to. It is a need to. You may have also heard the church referred to as the visible church. These are other definitions, which speaks of all those who profess Christ on earth. Of course, all those who profess Christ on earth in the visible church are not necessarily all true believers. And so this is in contrast to the invisible church, which speaks of the true church comprising all those both in heaven since the church age began and those in earth who are true believers. <clears throat> so you have the visible church and the invisible church, other definitions. There's also the terms you may have heard, the church triumphant and the church militant. The church triumphant refers to the church alive in heaven right now, whereas the church militant refers to the church alive on earth. And, and there's a oneness of those, again, in a mystical sense which is great to remember and an encouragement as we worship together. Point being, whether the church is alive or dead physically, it continues on in Christ. So the church can be defined in various ways, but for the purpose of this teaching series, our specific focus is upon the localized expression of the universal church. So we could define that in the following simple way, and this is a definition I stole from John Piper. He says, the local church is a group of baptized believers who meet regularly to worship God through Jesus Christ, to be exhorted from the word and to take part in the Lord's Supper under the guidance of biblically qualified leaders. I'll read that again. The local church is a group of baptized believers who meet regularly to worship God through Jesus Christ, to be exhorted from the word of God and to take part in the Lord's Supper under the guidance of biblically qualified leaders. Now that's a simplified definition, but it helps to shape our focus as we consider the importance of the church within these teachings. So let's move on then. And what we're going to do now is look at the unfolding revelation of the church in scripture and its origins from where it first began up until the time the church was established and formed into that which continues to our present day. So firstly then, let's start with a big picture. And these points are on your outlines. God has revealed to us through his word, his plan of redemption from Genesis to Revelation. That is the, the big, big picture. And it's true to say that this redemptive plan is all centered around the person and work of Jesus Christ. God's plan has been revealed, Genesis to Revelation, and it all centers around the person and work of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 10, 7 says, then I said, behold, I have come, this is Christ speaking, in the volume of the book, it is written of me, in the volume of the book, to do your will, O God. Quoting there from Psalm 40, verses 6 to 8. So what we also see then, in addition to these initial points, is that God's plan of redemption is that through the atoning work of his son, Jesus Christ, who is both fully God and fully man, he would save all those whom he is predestined to salvation from before the foundation of the world, granting them forgiveness and eternal life through him. And we're going to look at some verses as we go through. Lots of verses that really um, undergird these statements. Ephesians 3, 7 to 11 says, In him we have redemption through his blood. the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. This, this summarizes that plan 
of the Lord. And so what we also see here then is that the church plays a significant role in God's plan of redemption, fulfilling a distinct purpose for a specific period of time known as the church age. And this period extends from the day of Pentecost until the rapture of the church. Now, I don't want to get off topic with the different eschatological views about this time period, because we can say that all views would generally see the church beginning at the same point, the day of Pentecost, and then continuing until either the rapture or the second coming, depending on what view you hold of eschatology. Another way of saying this is that the church age speaks of the period of time in which the Holy Spirit permanently indwells God's people. That's the church age. In contrast to the Old Testament and gospel period where the Holy Spirit's indwelling was temporary. So if we consider Romans 11, 24 to 26, it says, For if you were cut out the olive tree, speaking to the church, which is wild by nature and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these who are natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? So the church was grafted from the olive tree of Israel, as it were. I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until, so God's plan with Israel is on pause, until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And that there speaks of that, that period, that um, time in which God will deal with his church, will save his people. And then it says, so all Israel will be saved as it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. What we also need to understand then is that we are currently in that period of time known as the church age, which although distinct is connected to the covenant promises made to both Abraham and David. So we are currently in that period of time known as the church age, which although distinct is connected to the covenant promises made to both Abraham and David. Let's have a look at this. Luke 1, 31 to 33. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there'll be no end. So you see there the link to the Davidic um, covenant. And then we see in Galatians 3, 5 to 9, Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Just as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Therefore, know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. There's the look ahead to the Messiah. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. So we are spiritual sons of Abraham. We are not physical descendants. We're spiritual descendants. Galatians 3.29 says, And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That original Abrahamic covenant promise. So we know then, in this sense, that the Old Testament looks towards Christ, the Messiah. The New Testament reveals and then looks back to Christ and also looks ahead to Christ as Lord over his earthly and then eventually heavenly kingdom. So next then, let's look at the question, where did the church begin? When did the church begin? Now, in answer to this question, I would say there is a theologically technical answer and a theologically practical answer. What do I mean by this? Well, a theologically technical answer would be that the idea, the concept, the plan for the church essentially began before time, before the heavens and earth were created, within an intra-Trinitarian agreement between the Father, Son, and of course, the Holy Spirit. It is when the agreement was made that the Father would give Christ his gift of the inheritance of nations. So we see in Psalm 2 verse 8, that verse is not on the outlines, you may want to note that down. Psalm 2 verse 8, speaking of the inheritance of nations. 
Now, some branches of Reformed theology refer to this as the covenant of redemption. It's the same basic concept. It's just understood um, differently with different nuances by different people. But God's plan for redemption was part of what we refer to as God's eternal decree. So we can say then that God's plan for the church was decreed, which means it was ordained before time. That's the theologically technical answer. We see God's plan for the church decreed. Let's look at a few verses on this. John 6, 37 to 38. Jesus says, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I'll be no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven, and there you see the acknowledgement of the mission, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Christ was sent by the Father, determined before time began. John 17, 3 to 5. And this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do again. You see the definition of the mission. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. And you see in, this, in these verses that link to um, eternal existence, pre-creation, linked to the mission of Christ fulfilled on earth. Acts 4, 27 to 28, For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. The whole um, ministry of Christ, his death, burial, resurrection, were determined before the foundation of the earth. And then, of course, we see Romans 8, 28 to 30. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. It is what we see in verse 29, God's foreknowledge, God's um, eternal decree that makes it possible to believe the truths in verse 28. This is why God can work things together for good, because it's part of his sovereign eternal decree. We then look at 1 Corinthians 2, 6 to 8, that says, However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom, again, which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Ordained before the ages. And then I'll read this passage, a longer passage here in Ephesians chapter 1, which just hammers all of this home so beautifully. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both in heaven and in the earth. In him, in him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. So if you can follow that, that's the theologically technical answer as to when the church began before time. Now the theologically practical answer then is simply that the church began on the day 
of Pentecost? We'll look at that in a moment, but in between these two answers, the theologically technical answer and the theologically practical answer, we need to insert, insert another event within the timeline, and that is this. God's plan for the church announced, proclaimed by Christ. God's plan for the church was announced. And we see this in Matthew 16, verses 13 to 19. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon by jonah for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. There is the announcement of Christ, his work to build the church. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So we see there the church is announced as Christ proclaims his plan for the church. Built upon the foundation of that rock, which is really a, a twofold meaning of Peter's confession of Christ being the Messiah, his Lord, his Savior, which is inseparable from Christ himself as the rock. What we also see as we look through the unfolding revelation of scripture is God's plan for the church initiated. And this is on the day of Pentecost. This is the theologically practical answer to when it began. God's plan for the church initiated on the day of Pentecost. So we look at Acts chapter 2 verses 1 to 4. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire. And one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And then down in verse 40 and with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayer. So the church is birthed on the day of Pentecost. And there's immediately 3,000 souls added to that church. So the church was initiated on the day of of Pentecost. Then we also see God's plan for the church established and that is throughout the book of Acts. And we're going to do a little sort of survey through some verses in Acts here. So God's plan for the church begins in on the day of Pentecost and then it's established throughout the book of Acts. Acts 2 46 to 47 so following this this great salvation of 3,000 souls it says continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved so it started well it continued well with people being saved daily Acts 5 42 jumping on a little bit on the timeline and daily in the temple and in every house they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. That was the mission of the church as they gathered and as they taught and as they proclaimed the gospel. Move along more in the timeline, Acts 6 verse 7, then the word of God spread. The number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Continuing along on the timeline, Acts 9 1 to 6, we're introduced to this character Saul who would become the apostle Paul. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who are of the way, those in the church, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? 
And he said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goad. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise, go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. In that passage, we see pre-conversion Saul against the church, killing people in the church. And then we see the Lord sovereignly saving Saul and appointing him as an incredibly significant figure in the early church. That's a very important part of the timeline. And we see this in Acts 9.15. The Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. So there is the, uh, the call of God to Saul, to Paul, to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. Now, the gospel was kind of trickled to the Gentiles before Saul's official or Paul's official ministry. And we see this in Acts 10, 44 to 45. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because of the gift of the Holy Spirit that had been poured out on the Gentiles also. So there's the beginnings of God beginning to move and bring salvation to the Gentiles. And then in a more official sense, as Paul begins his incredible um, first of three missionary journeys in Acts 13, verses 2 to 3, where the gospel starts to really spread, we see the call of Saul um, to go on this mission. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them and they sent them away. And aren't we glad they did? <laughs> they sent them away. And because of that, we have been recipients of this blessed gospel. So then, tying into this, this is not from the book of Acts, but this is written in the timeline of Acts. We see in Ephesians, this foundation beginning to form, Ephesians 2, 19 to 22. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built, here's the key, on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God, in the spirits. This shows us that on the biblical timeline within the book of Acts, God was building a foundation. Christ was the cornerstone. Then he had the apostles and the prophets who formed, if you like, the other sort of three quarters of that um, foundational stone upon which the church would then be built. And then we see how the church was continued to be built in Ephesians 4 verses 7 to 16. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this he ascended. What does it mean? But also he first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And here we see the key verses. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, that's that foundational stone. Some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. That's now building on that stone for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. I love these verses. And what you see so clearly here is God builds the foundation, Christ the cornerstone, the apostles and prophets complete the foundation which tells us why we do not have apostles and prophets today. Because that was a unique part of the foundation. We do not need to build the foundation again. But then we had evangelists as the word was spread, and then pastors and teachers, the establishing of the local church to equip believers for the work of ministry to take it to the world. 
<coughs> excuse me. And then we see, again, within the timeline of Acts, but a different book, in 1 Timothy, chapter 3, the qualifications of elders and deacons. So God is then forming the church. He's establishing the church. He's bringing organization to the church. It says, this is a faithful saying, if a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach in the snare of the devil. So that's the elders. Likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. But let those... Sorry, I lost my place there. Um, let those also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderers, temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children in their own houses well. For those who've served well as deacons, obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So Paul wrote to Timothy because the church was in a bit of disarray. It had been established. There'd been a lot of conflict. There'd been a lot of opposition. There'd been a lot of false teaching. Things have been shaken up. And so he kind of brought some, some more structure and organization, which has continued on from then until our very day. And as we go back to the book of Acts, at the end of the book of Acts, we see these beautiful words in Acts 28, verse 30 to 31. Paul is in prison. And this is before his death, of course. And it says, then Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house and received all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding him. So Paul is there in prison, in, in a still in prison, still chained to a guard, but in a different type of environment than he would have been um, previously in his earlier imprisonment. And the gospel, the church, continued on from there. Paul would then be uh, martyred himself. And then we have the epistles that are written by himself and the other disciples. And we see that initial birth of the church. We see those origins of the church. And so what we have seen then throughout this sort of biblical theology here is God's plan for the church decreed. We've seen God's plan for the church announced. We've seen God's plan for the church initiated and we've seen God's plan for the church established. The church that God established has continued on since the first century until today. And so this is a great reminder to us that we are part of that biblical timeline. We are deeply connected to the saints of the past who have gone before us since the day of Pentecost. And so as we conclude this time in God's word today, let us be encouraged that despite all that is happening in our world right now, despite the restrictions and the limitations we face, the fact remains that Christ has said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. That is Christ's word to us. And so we can be encouraged in the simple fact that nothing can stop God's plan for the church. Nothing can stop God's plan for the church. It's an eternal plan decreed before time even began. And no matter what persecution, hostility or conflict comes, the church will be preserved. We will have the victory and we will dwell with Christ throughout all eternity. And these verses in Revelation I want to leave you with speak of this so beautifully. Speaking of heaven in verses 3 to 5, Revelation 22. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it. And his servants shall serve him. That's us. They shall see his face. That is us. And his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun. For the Lord God gives them light. 
and they shall reign forever and ever. That is the hope of the church, Christ's church to which we each belong and will belong for all eternity. So I hope this has been an encouragement to you and I hope as, as the ecclesio <laughs> it's a hard word to say, the ecclesiological hose has been turned on and we've attempted to saturate ourselves more, that there is a deeper um, appreciation and love for the church of which Christ purchased with his own blood. I just want to say that if there's anyone who might be listening to this live stream who is not a Christian, but you are understanding some of these things, you want to know more on our website, um, communitybiblechurch.org. Don't understand. On the front page, you'll see a little link there that says about finding more out about the gospel. I'd love you to visit that and read about this gospel truth where we find salvation through Christ, through repentance and faith. So I'm just going to pray now and then we will sing another song of worship together in our homes. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have given us this incredible gift of the church that you purchased with your blood. Christ's blood given for us. Lord, I pray that as we continue over these coming weeks to look at these beautiful truths about the church, that we'll be so encouraged, so blessed, so strengthened in your provision for us, in the work that you have called us to for such a time as this. Help us, Lord, in this coming week to find our strength in you, to find our perspective in your word, and to serve wholeheartedly as much as we can in that which you've called us to do for your glory. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.